Hey everybody, welcome to Ask the Anabolic Doc, starring Dr. Thomas O'Connor, brought to you by his websites, metabolicdoc.com and anabolicdoc.com. Also, check out his YouTube channel, Anabolic Doc. And of course, at those websites and on Amazon.com, you can pick up America on Steroids, A Time to Heal. Great book, great read. You can read a chapter every time you go to the bathroom like I did. That's how I finished it in two days. That's how many times I go to the bathroom. Doctor, how are you, sir? Excellent, Ron. Beautiful summer. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, we're going back to the original format of the show today, which was questions. We haven't done that in a while. Uh, so let's get rolling. we got some good ones. We've been, I've been saving up for a... Because I've been stealing all your, uh, your drug profile shows. So today I'm, we're finally going to get back to the, the original format. Number one, Dr. Thomas, I'd like to ask a question related to body fat index. Please, if you believe this is an important to topic, you can make a video about it. Well, here we are. Nowadays, there's a lot of charts discussing body fat index where other gurus are going over and over about body fat index. There are differences between the charts and also differences between recommended weight and body fat index. To be completely honest with you, I have never met a man that can reach the lean section of the chart without the help of performance enhancing medication. By this, I mean a person that is within reasonable body weight. I'm not including people that live in tribes in a hunter-gather society <laughs> or, or run on average 12K a day. Who does that? What is your opinion on this? And do charts, are, this is not English, English is his first language, obviously. Are, do, a, are charts real or is this just another tool for the fitness industry to put a carrot in front of the donkey? Thank you. That's awesome. That's actually a good question, a different question. So, you know, the body max index, Ron, right, BMI? Yep. And like... A lot of this stuff, you know, is initially based off the insurance algorithms, right? You know, life insurance, you know, you know it's really true. You know, so when guys, you know, guys like us have, we're like obese, even because the muscle, the body mass, you know, it's, what is it? It's your height in meters divided by uh, your, or I think the kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the body mass and everyone's obese. So, but, but that, that's actually, so that's, like charts to me that's like bmi that's like the charts you know insurance charts and and, and beyond that I, I have an exercise physiology graduate degree so i remember when i did my ex phys work back in the 90s we did a lot of uh like the caliper ron you know caliper we did body fat analysis right for for people like in fit you know we were getting ready to work like sports medicine and in gyms and everything rehabilitation centers so you body fat remember the calipers oh yeah absolutely so, Th those are notoriously a lot of error, and if you have a certain amount of body fat, there air, there's a lot of error. Remember, remember, like behind the tricep, on the pec. Yeah. So, like, but if, if you're lean enough, they're actually pretty accurate if they're done properly. Then there's like the back, and there's genetics, though. So th those are really kind of, you know, they're not. That, and now those are off of the charts, right? Because you're putting these numbers in, and you have like 10 percent, 15 percent. I think the average man is 15. And that's actually pretty good. And then you're really, really lean. When you're around 10, right, when you're under 10%, like, and it's interesting, like, the pro bodybuilders, they, too, get down to, like, probably f legitimately 5%, maybe even 3 or 5. I'd say, I'd definitely say, like, if you look at, if you can see every fiber of, of muscles right. from head to toe, that's got to be, like, 2 or 3%. It just has to well, be. He, well, here's the deal. So that was a whole argument for years and years with the exercise physiology guys saying that, you, you can't live. I actually would love to have the answer to this because I'm not an exercise scientist, you know, on that PhD level or any guy. Like, what? How, what is the truth? And then when you're measuring the subcutaneous fat, you have to have a certain amount of visceral fat, you know, fat function for your brain to fun. So I think you're right, though. I think it's about it's sub five. They're less than five, and you you know, it's not really sustainable. You can't live on that every day for like those guys get down. Which is the, that's the amazing thing of bodybuilding to me is that you guys are able to do this incredible act where it takes, you know, of course, dieting, training, uh, not eating, and then of course, of course, different drugs. Not to mention DMP and you know Cytomel and uh, Lasix and all. But in the end, they have such low body fat and they're holding it for that one day, right? Like what two days? You know, the night before. One or two so, days, yeah. So, so they're, they're, these are body fat levels that are no one's going to disagree. They're they're definitely under like five percent, seven percent, and then so how do you get down there? Well, the truth is there's so much, and then oh, and to check it, like underwater weighing, hydrostatic, yeah, 
Hydrostat, that's right. Hydrostat, that's the most, remember that? Remember the exercise physiology studies? But don't think. <laughs> it is true. So I did it on people, like in the chair, hold your breath. We had to like calculate the chair, like the old, you know, lawn chair. Yeah. And like that, that, that's actually true. If you do that accurate, now you have the, the electronic ones, though, you stand on. And I'm not sure how accurate. So the truth is body fat. They're, they're, not, they're not really that accurate. And the thing is, most people, Ron, you know, you could eyeball people and you could see how much body fat they have. So, and then if we're doing it for health, like, you know, there's an argument that there's, there's obese well. You know, there's people that are kind of like um, skinny fat, but they're healthy and they're, they live. You know, that's the, par the obesity paradox. Not if you're really obese, but kind of overweight. There's some people, and, and it may actually relate, I think, more to women than men, but I, I could be a little bit. I think it's skewed to that they're kind of heavier and they're, they're very healthy. The blood pressure, cholesterol, genetics, they don't smoke, and they, they live a healthy, long life, and they don't have to be that thin. Matter of fact, if you get too thin when you get older, it, it does correlate to, you know, to early mortality. Hmm. You know, being too thin, be, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's people that are, but there, if someone's too thin, it's because there, there's something wrong, right? There, there's some disease process, or they're just not healthy, or neurotic, or they're, you know, they're, there's something wrong. So th those charts, are, are they are what they are but I don't know who's using the chart but to get mo a lot of patients when I you know that we see in exercise physiology and in medicine and primary care you try to get people as lean as they can just by sustainability but the truth is there are some guys that have great genetics and women and they're just ripped to shreds naturally so isn't that true Ron I hate them all yes it's true I mean come on the top pro bodybuilders like guys like Ronnie and Jay they, they have super genetics they're very lean anyway, and then when they diet down, forget the drugs, they're, they're able to hold a lot more muscle because of the drugs and that physique and that hard, you know, look. But they, 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 these are just lean. Yeah, I mean, I used to try to explain to people because they don't get it. You know, I would these guys in the off season, they could blow up 40, 50, 60 pounds over their stage weight, but they still weren't fat. You could still see muscle separation. You could still Such see genius. some abs. They, they never looked fat. I don't... Someone like that would probably have to be bedridden for a year or two to actually get fat. You know? And you know what? You know what? You know, one person I could throw a name out. I remember Iris Kyle. I know you know Iris oh, yeah, Kyle. Of course, of course. So I've talked to, you know, I know over the years when I was going to the shows and stuff, when I was writing for you guys, you know, 10 years ago, I met Iris just at one of, in Mr. It, it, uh, probably the Arnold. And she's such a, not, what a nice woman, such a nice person. Yeah. I remember I cursed in front of her and she was kind of like, put it like, Doc, please don't curse. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I, so she was, I was talking to her about looking at how lean she was. It's freaking, her anterior, I was like, she goes, go ahead, Doc, you can touch it. Just be careful. I was like, okay. And like, it was like, it was like, like, like saran wrap literally on her calf. Like it was just like tight. It was like this thin. It was just on free and she goes you know i go i go how do you do this and she goes ah you know just techniques to it and stuff and a lot of hard training and you can't you got to eat and she goes you know what when i was a little girl when i was always young when i was a little girl baby a girl a teenager she goes i was always i could eat ice cream there it is she was ripped yeah. 24 7 she was like eating with every food ice creams and just food like anyone else in the summertime she was 16 17 with a pigtail, she showed me a picture. She goes, "Look at me there." She just, she was, so that's just one hundred percent genetic. Yeah, yeah. And then people, you know, they they modify it with. So I'm trying to answer the guy's question. Like th those things are right. Those charts are right. But to get down there, the rest of us, you have to calorically restrict yourself. Okay. Right, Ron? I mean, calories. It's calories, calories, cal. You right. got to cut, you know, carbs mainly. We know carbs are the poison, but then fats and you get it depending on your training. And then we know the drugs work, Ron, but they're not. The drugs actually kind of just dial up your own genes, right? Don't you agree with me on that? I do. I do. I want, I'm going to rip right through the questions because we've got so many damn questions. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. This could – we, you could talk about this one all day, I'm sure. So we're going to have to do let's like – because he's asking something you, we addressed a million times in different ways. Is TRT good for old men? Or are men naturally not meant to produce testosterone later in life the same way? Is TRT bad? No, no. So, so, so I'm going to do this really quick. TRT is bad. No, it's it's good if you need it. So men get it's obviously a multiple billion dollar business. I mean, and men 
get older, around the age of 30, they start to lose 1% of testosterone a year, and that's just like an andropause. So men get older. What's old? 55. If you're my kid's 13, I'm old to him. Right. You know, but but to me, a 75 year old guy's old. So so you know, an older. So you you get men lose testosterone as they get older. But the truth is, you know, we don't know. Like the, the most men don't need to replace it. That's just how we look at it today. But that may be wrong. Men that have low T die early from from disease. L- nothing to say. Men that have low testosterone, that's going to be less than 250 nanograms per deciliter. They, 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 they die before men that don't have it. There's not, why? A cart in the horse. We don't even know. So, so men get older. This is apart from steroid use where, you know, my expertise, anabolic steroid induced hypogonadism. Men that get older, they, they, they slowly or steadily don't feel well, and it, it relates to fatigue and tiredness. And then, yeah, there's some sex in there. And I have a lot of guys that are, my age and older, maybe 10 years, and they're like, Doc, do I have to treat my low T? I'm like, no, you don't have to treat your low T. <laughs> what, 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 Doc, do I, because I don't want to, like, be, I don't want to have more sex. Oh. You know why? Because a lot of men, when they get to that age, Ron, they just had, an, they want to have reg, maybe sex once in a while. Um, it's amazing, Ron, to hear that. Maybe that they're sick of their wife or something, you know. Could Ron, I'm not too. kidding. <laughs> but, Ron, I'm not kidding. But, but isn't that amazing? Like, no. So the truth is, I mean, you know, the average man who's really healthy, which in America we have an epidemic of being unhealthy. So the average man, you don't need to treat it. And is it good to treat? Yeah. If you have low T and you're you're monitored properly and you don't have cancer or heart disease and you're putting on testosterone, guys, you feel pretty good. Yeah. So, but you, but it's not like not an easy, that's, you know, it's not an easy answer. Like you said, well, how's that? It, it just comes down to quality of life. I mean, yeah, we are meant exactly. to, we are meant to produce less testosterone as we age. We're meant to have, lose muscle and bone density and yeah. libido and uh, energy and all that. That's how yes. we're that's how we're meant to be. But do you want to be that way? Do you want to when there are options when you don't have to live your life like that? So so that and the whole question is, Ron. That's perfect. Boy, I wish I answered it like that because it's so it's so ba- it's basic. So the truth is, when do you when do we intercede when do we act in at 40 something when my t is dropped in half and it's 400 but it's still normal i mean that's the whole controversy now or the ethical divide like when do we treat a man with t and then so many men run and that's one of the side of the anti-aging places again that you know i'm not a fan of those places but they have a big business because most of those guys don't have low t because they're de- but they say Fuck it. I, I just, can I just, I started testosterone or I did it myself or I went on, I, it was amazing because the man's brain, when you give it testosterone, not to mention injections yeah. with esters, the free testosterone goes higher versus gels and pellets and your brain, we're not the brightest bulbs in the tree, our brains go like this, whoa, and you feel good. You're hornier. The brain feels, Ron, it's, no one could argue the data, but the thing is, is it ethical to treat a man who has like normal testosterone? I mean, do you, do you have to let him crash? You see, isn't it amazing? Like what point, is it a number on paper or, or are we acting, you know, to build him and to maintain him, but then watch the side effects? I, that's just my perspective. Well, this, is your, this is your nine to five, so you tell me. You know, so I what, do. What is your, what is your personal stance on it? When do you, do you treat? If a guy comes in, he's got a 400 test, and uh, but he claims he's feeling low energy, low libido. You know, it doesn't really add up with norm, with what's on the on the the chart of normal testosterone level. How do you decide whether you're going to treat him with TRT or not? So, so I, I, I'm, I try to, I tend to stay careful. And at total testosterone, I look at the free. And you can see a div- you can see a disparity between the free and the freeze low. He has low T, and the doctors who check the total they don't know what they're doing because sex hormone binding globin can be elevated and can be sex hormone binding globin could be too active. And this is all the doctor T stuff. This is real. This is real medicine. And a lot of the anti aging guys they don't they, they just kind of treat everyone. But if a guy has 400 or sub 400, he's tired, he feels bad. You give him a trial of testosterone. I've learned this because I've seen people do it. They say, Doc, forget that that number wasn't low. What was it? What was it then? Because I feel so much better, doctor. Hmm. So those guys all come to me. There's not really too many men that come. They come. Ninety percent of my business are men. They're all on testosterone from from themselves. Yeah. 
and, and they're not pros. They're all just regular guys. They're just on testosterone themselves. There's millions upon millions, and they're in and out of clinics, and they're just like, Doc, can you please, like, help me out? You, you, I see you as, like, I'm like, you're like my primary care doctor. Like, I trust you. You're not trying to sell me stuff. So, but I'm worried, Doc. You know, they're puffy. They're hypertensive. You know, gynecomastia and all this kind of stuff, the prostate. I mean, come on. This is my job. So I, I, I tend not to treat guys who have normal testosterone, but I try to run. I try to find out what's wrong. And sometimes they, they are around there, but the free is always going to be low. So they really, they, they, they technically, the, 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 the total's inaccurate because the free is low. Yeah. And then, then, when, then when I, so I, I, they have to have something. They can't be normal guys. But when guys come in, guys do come in with 700 or the free is frankly low. I don't treat them, Ron. I do a good job. I do a good hour consult. They, they don't pay, you know, they pay for the hour consult. I, I always spend like an hour and 20 minutes. I bend over backwards. I try to. I reverse. I, I point things out. But 95 percent of my business are guys that are already on. So I don't even have to make that decision. But I. A lot of guys. Doc, can I come off? <laughs> of course you can come off. What's, <laughs> but once they're on testosterone for five years or something, Ron. Yeah. None of us are. No one. No one. You know that. No one's coming off. So true. <laughs> All right, I mean, moving. we got to move right along. We got so many go, questions. Go. Swaminator, he posted this as a thread on MD No Bull like two, three weeks ago. So, Swami, we're finally getting to you. Uh, it was about a study he saw on uh, PubMed. Was it PubMed or NCBI? The, anyway, it's thyroid meds combined with TRT equals myocardial infraction. Perhaps oh the anabolic doc can weigh in the, in this one. Sounds concerning since so many TRT guys are also on thyroid meds. I just told you I get a call from lawyers every month. I get a call from one lawyer because the doctor or the physician's assistant is losing their license. They're under investigation oh or worse, and it's an anti-aging doctor. And the, the the patient had either a heart attack or a stroke. And because anything else before that, no one just seems to even give a shit. Yeah. But they have a stroke or heart attack. Now the wife or the guy, if he's still alive, is lawsuits. And it's game on. And here's what I see, because I've already looked. The attorneys have sent over some of the stuff. I've never taken one of these cases. You know, I'm the anabolic doc, so I'm the top of the guy of the world. They, they want me to go from a witness and to say to protect their doctor. And I, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable doing it. I've never. I've been offered 50 of these. I have never taken one. I never will. So I don't. I don't feel comfortable because I, I. I disagree with anti-aging. So these guys are definitely giving. Everyone's on thyroid. I have to, when these guys come in, I did one today. I stopped the thyroid. I, do, I look at the thyroid. What are you on? Cytomel, cop, uh, Armor Thyroid, Cytomel, T4, testosterone, aromatase inhibitor, maybe HCG, uh, growth hormone, depending on how much they can afford. So I say, you know, all this other stuff. Did you? Is what's your TSH? So what, what, let me look at your, your initial thyroid panel. It's it's always normal. Hmm. So Swaminator, something. These guys are get, these are inappropriately. God, now, not to mention, if a guy has low normal T and he, the testosterone helps and the guy feels hornier, that's an aphrodisiac. I mean, like, we're not going to talk about that because that's a whole other animal. Yeah. But giving men thyroid preparations when they have completely normal central nervous system pituitary output, this is like freaking so unethical. Mm -hmm. So it does myocardial infarction. Here's what happens. It's, yeah. it, it pops them into AFib. It, when you give thi when you're thyroid toxic, depending on who you are and where moons are lining up, you pop into H. It's SVT. Everyone goes into AFib, and if you if you launch an emboli up, you can, that's why AFib people have strokes. I mean, so it's it's not really heart attack, uh, Swaminator. It's 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 CVAs. It's 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 embolic strokes, and they're 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 damaging their hearts because they're thyrotoxic. And why does it happen to all the young bodybuilders? They're goddamn young. It, 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 this is happening more to someone that has a propensity for it, for an SVT, for an arrhythmia. It's, an, it's a superventricular tachycardia. It's AFib. It's as common as the goddamn sun's coming up tomorrow morning when you get uh, – everyone has AFib in America. Hmm. And if you give it to someone who doesn't have it but they're on the fringe yeah. and poof. So – and then this person doesn't know and they're an AFib. I mean this is this – is, you don't treat people with things they don't need. So that, that well, let's back up. Let's let's say somebody does legitimately have a need for thyroid meds, 
I treat it every day. I treat it every day. And they're on TRT. Is there any huge risk no. of heart attack with that interaction? Oh, no. No. no? Oh, okay. I mean, that, that's, what I, that's what I was thinking based on no. just that little blurb no. that I saw. No, 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 no. Everything should be in it appropriately. Every medicine is so complicated. That's why I have a good day job. You take everything independently. You, you treat the whole person. But, Ron, I mean, internal medicine this is internal medicine. It's this way. It's all in the streets of the bro science. That's why I have a good job. Testosteronology. This actually is testosteronology. Yeah, I mean, it's right. cool stuff. It's just fun. But that, that, and I understand where he's coming from. What's happening is he, see, this guy's in this, he's seeing some, uh, he sees some of the data that I see in law enforcement stuff, you know? So like, he, he, what's happening is these, the, see that right there, their lawsuits, they're losing their licenses. Because they put a guy in inappropriate medicine, something happens. The the lady, the wife calls a lawyer. It's game over. Mm, wow. And the lawyer goes in there and he gets the chart. He gets a subpoena. They take the chart and they look and they bring it to a, 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 an expert, a medical. The, the the lawyer may even be a doctor himself. That's a, that's a good business, huh? You're a doctor and a lawyer. What? Those guys make. Those guys make. Oh, they make. They were my. I went to med school. I was very scared of them. You know, they're, they're, they're lawyers first usually, and they get an MD, and then I don't know. I don't think they're doing it to be med mal guys, but hey, they they're smart as crap, and they're not going to lose too many arguments. So they they get a lawyer, they get a doctor, and uh, they say, well, you were an AFib, and you had a stroke or a heart attack, and you were on all these medicines that you apparently didn't need. Yeah. Hmm. And ask the doctor. Ask doctor. So can you tell us the justification? Believe me. What's the justification for giving that? What's the standard? Of care? Standard you breaks. You're breaking standard of care. The doctor's license is pulled immediately. Wow. Hmm. All these doctors are taking a lot of chances. By the way, they got a lot of balls. These doctors. You're talking about the ones associated with the uh, the clinics we're talking about. Yeah, are they, I I think they're they're yeah. they're look. Let's just t let's just call it what it is. They're really not good doctors. They're not academic board certified. They're taking this job because. They have no choice. They feel they have no choice because they don't want to drive an Uber. They really are not. The anti-aging is not respected, Ron. Hmm. Anti-aging is not respected. Hmm. It's just not. It's just. It's a. It's a way to give steroids and drugs to people. I mean, the patients love it, but you know, other than that. Of course. Well, well, not not for long. <laughs> so there it is. Okay, let's keep moving. Let's keep okay, going. Okay, this is a long question, Doc. So do you have a snack? I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. I got. A, hold on, my poodle. Yeah. Poodle. Okay, you might want to. Might want to relax for a minute. Okay, it would be nice to cover the topic of gyno development after cycle, in my case, three months after, and how to manage it in case of steroid use. For sure, I'd say not aromatizing products, or if aromatizing products are used with it, anti-aromatase or anti-estrogens. Any suggestion on the best approach would be appreciated. After my experience, I stopped using steroids more than 10 years ago now, but I still love to train, and since I'm now over 40, I'm considering TRT, or very light gear use, but I'm worried to worsen the situation. This is what happened to me years ago. Even your dog says, get a, let's get this moving. I wasn't a heavy user. One or two cycles per year of 8 to max 12 weeks, mainly using Sustanon or Testanate at 250 milligrams a week, Deca 200 to 300 milligrams a week, or Dianabol 10 to 20 milligrams a day, and Test, and Anthate or Sustanon, same day, doses as above. I don't know why he repeats the testing. For cutting, mainly test propionate, 100 milligrams every other day, and Winstrol Depot, 50 milligrams every other day. During cycles, HCG, 2,500 IU once a week to maintain testicular atrophy. I think he means to prevent testicular atrophy. As anti-estrogen, mainly Nolvidex, and I also did a try with the anti-aromatase Arimidex with no big advantages over Nolva, use these mainly to control water retention. PCT in the classic way, Nolva or Clomid, plus HCG at standard doses. I did this for some years with no big issues. During cycles, never had any gyno signal at all. I think he means symptoms. Then one year, three months after a cutting cycle with test prop and win, and also after my PCT, I started to feel pain under my nipples and developed gyno under both. Two lumps, painful when touched and very disturbing. Took immediately Nolva, Nolvadex, 20 milligrams a day. In around 10 days, the pain disappeared on both the right, on both, and the right lump went away completely. The left one shrunk a little, but is still there, and also developed a little of soft tissue around it. I was told this can happen with Winstrol. Don't know if it's true, considering it should not aromatize. This is more than 10 years ago, and even after a lot of years off gear, both my nipples are still very sensitive to estrogen. And if my fat level goes too high or I drink alcohol on a regular basis, beer in particular, 
I start to feel them again and I have to use Novadex. Sorry for this long post, but this is my experience and also for my English, that is not my language. Would awesome. be great to have the doc thinking on it. This, all right, so I'm going to try to keep it focused. So, I mean, gonaco, let's talk about it. Gonocomastia, I just did, all, I did a whole series, a three-part series on, on anti-estrogens on my YouTube. So not only do I do it every day, but I had to bone up for this with the research and to really know the mechanism. So let's make it really simple. You know, so men, men take steroids. Some of them are aromatizable. Some are estrogenic and some are not, right? Yeah. You, you know that. Yeah. So DR, DHT derivatives and, and, you know, less than NOR19. And then the, the testosterone ones are all aromatizable, as you know. Yeah. So, and everyone's on some form of testosterone injectables, ester anyway. So... The guy, t and he's young, the difference with this guy is that he's young during year, you know, when you're young, you can do any, I mean, basically anything. And then it, people get older and things change and things build up. So when, when, when men take aromatizable steroids, you know, depending on the genetics, again, the genetics, some guys lose hair, some guys don't, some guys have these issues, depending on the drug regimens. And then most guys will get a little bit. And then so what they, they obviously, during the steroid cycle or on TRT, they're using, there's only three drugs. It's very simple. Aromidase inhibitors, you know, like Letrosol, right, or Rimidex. Yeah. Then, you know, then there's a couple of those, and one's like a suicidal, one's a real, a different type of blocker, but they're aromidase inhibitors. And then you have Novadex. We don't use, it's interesting, and again, I'm not putting the guy down. If you look at the details, the way he's writing is, he's just, he, I'm not saying he doesn't know this stuff, but he used it, but... There's the two serum, you have aromatase inhibitors that will block systemic conversion. Your whole body, this is kind of Dr. George stuff, Dr. T. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's very simple. It blocks, it's used, it de devastates, it blocks conversion from testosterone, androgen to, es to estrogens. In the, it, it just does. It does it endogenously, it does it to the exogenous, very powerful. So, and then the other one is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's, co it's called Novadex. It's the clomid, cl clomiphene is, is an anti-estrogen in the brain. We use it to get testosterone levels up for fertility. Right. We, and, and the post-cycle therapy, we, we use these together because we're trying to overstep them to get the brain going. Okay, no one uses clomid for, for breast tenderness. Steroid users use, use tamoxifen during cycle because it's not a systemic blocker. It's an on-site blocker at the nipple cell site. Now, did you you know the stuff, Ron? I hope this is good for everyone. Uh, I didn't know all this. No, <laughs> it's very con it's very straightforward. So men will use aromatase inhibitors are the essence of what men use when they're on because it will if you start steroids and you use these drugs at the same time, you'll definitely never get gyno. Hmm. Now, now that be, now if you have how much do you have to use? Are you coming on? Are you coming off? But those drugs are devastating to men. Now, forget the, forget the heart attacks, which that's what I got to worry about for men, is aromatase inhibitors, men feel, if you just want to take out all your, your, your estrogen, es estradiol, it's ultra-sensitive estradiol, you, you, oh, it's easy to do, Ron. Just take a, mil take a, take a milligram a day of, or for most men, on even a little bit of TRT, that will just take it out. Now, you're going to feel flat in the brain, you're, you're gonna you're 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 brittle you're dry right so the guys have injuries i've seen i've i've this is i've been doing this for for over a decade it's amazing but powerlifters don't do it bodybuilders in the bulking stages don't they want to be they want to be they want the joints feeling better and then and then and, and and so so when you do romanist inhibitors it's so easy to just take off so much estrogen, but then everyone's measuring. It's all over the place. But you will never get gyno if you do if you take all these aromatase inhibitors. But guys don't do it when they're on. So then once once gyno, here's the secret, and I learned this over the years. And George and I have shared notes on this. We he, we all agree. Once you develop gynecomastia. When that lump in that re that that nipple region, which is the mammillary gland, it's a residual gland that men have to greater or lesser extents, different men. And when men say, "Doc, I was a fat kid. I had gyno coming into this because my I have fat," that's not gyno. No. That, that's your that's your body habitus. Gynocomastia is specifically the, but he could have both if, if he has the male boobs. I mean, I want to try to be honest. Men complain about this to me all the time. I'm like, "Sir, you don't have gyno." Gyno specifically right behind it. It's around that mammillary gland. You could have some some satellite gyno, 
but it's usually right there on the nipple behind it, and it's painful nodules. It develops, and once you develop it, it's hypertrophy. It actually, the gland is growing and enlarging, and then once, here's the bottom line, once you get this, yeah. using all those drugs will definitely lessen the symptoms, but it doesn't go away. Listen to the guy's story. Mm. You have to go to surgery, sir. You have to go to – that's why all the pros, they just go to that clown in New York or some other guys. They pay 8000 They pay 8000 bucks a pop. The guy's got literally like 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 six Ferraris out there and Lambos. Blau? Is it Blau? Dr. Blau? Yeah. Okay, we have a good one here in Massachusetts, Rick Silverman, who has – Oh, yeah. He's done thousands of gyno surgeries on many, many pros. I don't, Blau, I just – I mean, so many guys tell me he's just an arrogant guy. I mean, he's got some bad – sir, watch out for the lightning bolts because you got some bad karma coming. <laughs> You're making you're making a lot. Making money is great, but you're you're just banging through guys. He doesn't call guys back. I'm sorry. He doesn't get referrals from me anymore. I'm done. Yeah. Maybe maybe, maybe the other. We'll get, but before we so, continue so, disparaging him, let's continue. So I, I have to disparage the guy because he needs to be disparaged a little. He's got he got to stay in line in this world. Okay. Um. The the truth is, and the people the, the patients are are the are the, the the truth. You can't just do that to people. He's I don't like him. Okay. So when guys get gyno, they get gyno, and it can be a bear. It please do not just use these medicines with high doses unmonitored for months and months. Those are the guys that have heart attack. Because if you, I saw a number today from a guy I got to talk to in, in about a few days, maybe next week. His HDL is 10. I know he's back on. I, these are pros. I t I, the pros are coming back in. And I, he's taking the drugs he's taking. I love the guy and I'm going to be respectful. But I'm going to say, sir, your HDL is literally 10, 1, 0. Hmm. I mean, you're a young man. I don't know if I've done a calcium score on the guy. Probably haven't because he's very young. He's in his late 20s, maybe 30. Yeah. But he's got bad genetics for the family. I know he's got his dad had a heart attack. And he's, he's at a low HDL naturally. He's on some gear and he's using a Romanase inhibitor. Come on, man. HDL 10. He probably is not going to feel good. His brain, he may have some his, – his joints may feel brittle because he's dry. And it's just – Again, I use the drug sparing. I have my ways. I have ways how I use it, but I, I don't run it forever. And if a guy goes to the point where this guy is, I don't even – I say, sir, man, I, you know, I like tamoxifen. I use tamoxifen for – I'm giving the sequence. I run tamoxifen for a guy that we could done it for about 10 days. It probably is safer than the AIs for the cardiac. Well, there's no studies, but I agree. I like Bill Llewellyn. I think it may be true. I think in my eyes it's true. It's softer. It works. And then I stop it. And then guys go, Doc, you did it for a week or two. I, it went away. I'm game on. And I go. And then the guy maybe six months later, Doc, we do another run. And I do another run. And I, I, this is, how, Ron, I'm giving it out to you guys. This is how I do it. I use AIs. I use tamoxifen. I use Coleman. I don't use Coleman for this. No one uses Coleman for that. Hmm. It doesn't work that way. I want to be very, I want to tell the mechanism. I'm giving the secrets away. So I use it. But if I have a guy who's got gyno and he's got a long history of this and that, and he's got HDLs bad and I don't want to take a risk with the guy, I say, sir, forget Blau. Go to another plastic surgeon. And you know what? When they go, Doc, I wish someone would have told me that because why would you live on these dangerous drugs? To, you, have to, you have to blanket. You have to sterilize and your whole body gets affected mm. just to take out these little, little, little bumps. And I'm not putting the guy down. I, I have a, I've had a little guy no transiently here and there. It's annoying. So, it, so it, it, I would just go to a surgeon and take it out. I would never want to run – those drugs to DVTs, clots in the legs, heart attacks, mm. bone health, psychiatric health. I mean, the, and these are these men tell me this, Ron. I'm not, I'm not. I'm just reporting what what is known. How much risk do you want to take? And it, but it doesn't even work. You could sterilize the shit out of your body, have no undetectable estrogen, completely undetectable, and that will still stay there. Now Damn. it will it will shrink. It will go down. Oh, okay. But but. If you start from the beginning by never having it, that's the that's that would work. But then you're going to live on aromatase inhibitors forever. You see, I, I'm so, done. I'm sorry. So you said it would shrink, but if you stopped using the aromatase inhibitors, would they come right back? It's rebound. Yes. Yeah, so oh, and damn. every man, some now, Ron, some guys you're going to say, no. Well, Doc, I'm going to argue you. 
I, I, I did it during this time. I used electrosol combination, and it, it shrunk and it stayed away. It went away, but it got. I had to really hit it for a long time. I hope I'm okay. I hope. Who cares? My heart. Who cares? Yeah. And then I, I, it went away. And then I did a little. Then I went back on a cycle. Where I'm TRT even. And but, but, but I did some of this. I did, and then it came back. And then I, I'm on it now. Twice as long. It's not going away. I'm just trying to deliver the, the, the news here. So, it, it, it's. I use it for men. I use those drugs cautiously. And I, and they have. I measure ultra sensitive estrogen. Total total estrogen is useless. It, there's contamination with it. Mm -hmm. Ultra-sensitive estradiol, liquid chromatography, mass spectroscopy, very simple, I, I do it, and we get a real number, and then we look at it together, and I use maybe half a milligram of Arimidex, or Nostrazol, twice a week, and I try to have them come off in a few, maybe 10 weeks or six weeks, we recheck it, and then we try to lower the dose in micro dose, and then most of the men in the end, they, these are not, these are TRT guys, you know, they're not, They've given up. They've given up steroids. But the steroid guys, this is so it's freaking cowboy land because they're using so much. And I'm just watching it all and trying to block what they're doing and trying to talk them out of it. You know, I mean that's my. It's, it had to be a long. It had to be. Is that clear though, Ron? Is that was that a good answer? It was. It was a good answer. So for our final question, again, Swaminator, the all star of this show. He used to be. He's coming. He's making a comeback now. So no long explanation, just a quick shotgun Q and A. Let's go. Generally speaking, are the following over-the-counter meds slash supplements beneficial, not beneficial, or harmful for cardiac health for those on TRT? So the answers will be beneficial. How could I possibly? Oh, let's go. Let's go. That, yeah, it's going to have to be. So baby aspirin beneficial not beneficial or harmful for cardiac health i like it beneficial if you have heart disease we're going to keep you on low dose of aspirin hopefully you don't have a bleed in your head or your stomach i like it Let's, next question uh i know i in this in this at all i have no idea i know uh, at all yeah beneficial no, not beneficial no, be most, no benefit no benefit it doesn't end up leading to the endothelial tissue sustainably to protect from what it what it does it just, but there's gonna guys are gonna argue that no, there's no data for that. Uh, useless. Ubiquinol, also known as COQ10. Okay. Oh, so I could talk. I got to be careful. I got to talk for ten hours on this one. So you, you, it's it's a it's an endogenously mitochondrial enzyme for oxidation protection. It's kind of inherent. You get older, you lose it. Disease states will lower it. If statins, that I'm on statins, we're all on a little bit, right, Ron? We kind of. Run the hedge to try to keep the plaque out of the artery because we got some. So th those drugs notoriously have been concerned. Well, there's a concern with them that they lower uh, intramitochondrial cardiovascular endothelial, the, the ubiquinol CoQ10 levels. So why don't we give them back? And then also for people that have statin-induced myalgia is so achiness. So give, there's some studies that were kind of weak, but they showed prom. They showed that they could have helped. The um, ubiquinol. So I take 400 milligrams a day of true reduced CoQ10, not CoQ10. It's ubiquinol. Okay. So don't take. So I use it. I believe the studies, and I I want to keep my muscles is free of disease from statins. So I I take you know I take a bunch of cardiovascular drugs. That's my secret, and um, you know I do it with. I have doctors that prescribe it to me. So so and I feel good. But so. CoQ10, ubiquinol, game on. I, I think you got to have it. Niacin. Niacin has never been shown in, in studies to be a, a to in secondary trials where it doesn't protect against disease. There are two huge trials on this in the last 10 years that failed. But for primary care, niacin increases HDL and it does lower it does lower uh, LDL. So it was actually one of the first cholesterol medicines. So niacin is if you could tolerate it, right? Because you get this crazy flushing, uh, yeah. and some people, some people dig that, like 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 beta, beta alanine and all this. So 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 niacin, but it could. I've I had a guy recently. We had to stop it because he was on it. Liver enzymes skyrocketed, and I don't. I don't. I'm not going to bust his balls and say that that might have been the, the you know the D ball that he was taking, but he wasn't on D ball. We were like, wow, your your LFTs are up. It wasn't anything crazy, but they were legitimately elevated. And he goes, Doc, I. I go, would you start? Re this is what I do all day long. I, what, what did you change, man? He's been with me for two or three years. Would you change? Oh, I've been blasting niacin. Oh, I go, well, there it is. Hmm. So 
But it wasn't anything that was... So niacin, I like niacin. I, I think the studies show niacin is protective. You bought a watch your liver enzymes, and if they go up a little bit, no one's going to say it's going to be deadly, but you probably want to be careful, but niacin actually I think looks good. I think niacin's good if you don't have heart disease already. Fish oil or krill oil? Fish oil is never, oh boy, I talked to a guy about this about an hour ago as I was driving, I was talking to one of my patients. So fish oil is unfortunately never been shown to be protective for cardiac disease and I'm not I'm not I have no financial disclosures that I'm against them or for them but there is one I just don't want to say the name that that actually has shown statistical data to be supportive for protecting people from having another heart attack 25% reduction oh. and it's and I'm actually taking it and this is these are incredible medicines it's an EPA derivative uh, not EPA, DHE. That's that's all those are. Not, I could respond for an hour and a half on this. So the data is, ooh, it's dicey, but I don't think it's going to hurt you. Some people feel good on it. Get a very high quality, and my I would say go for reading on medical data for EPA much higher than DHA ratios. Consider EPA straight. Consider looking into what I'm talking about. I can't say the name. There's a medical grade. EPA that is, I'm on it, and it is game on. It is, I do every drug, I'll take any drug to protect my heart. Fair enough. That, that, that I need. If you don't need it, you don't take it. But I mean, I, I'm, I put these together, and it, man, libido and nitric oxide, you know, as far as the pump and just well-being and just feel, that's, and it's because it's an anti-inflammatory. Hmm. So fish oils, if you have the right type, if you believe it in the research, again, if you have heart disease or no heart disease, if you have elevated triglycerides, it's it's definitely helpful. But you got to you got to this is medicine though, sir. You can't just get so you got to go see a good cardiology or internist. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is awesome. Vitamin D is an anabolic drug. If you have low vitamin D, it's been no one's going to argue that you got a problem. There's rickets and osteomalacia, you know, and all these real medical terms, but but there there's vitamin D needs to be needs to be treated. It's easy to treat. Get in the sun a little bit. Or uh, take some vitamin D and just check the levels. Don't go too high because if you go too high, there's there's risk toxicities on that. So vitamin D is game on. Vitamin D is everyone. No one's going to argue that. Vitamin K. Vitamin K, I take it because I do believe that with the endothelial protection with vitamin D and vitamin K, and it's it's specific type of vitamin K, that it does protect against the, the, the progression of plaque and endothelial protect. So, yeah, there, there's data for that, yeah. Pomegranate. Pomegranate. Uh, pomegranate. Pomegranate's anti, you know, anti, I almost said anti-aging, antioxidant. And I think it's true, though. I think it's true. But so just, there's sugar in it, though, Ron. There's antioxidant, you know, wine and tan, tannins and flavonoids. Definitely. So you know what? Definitely. I love that stuff. But probably not in the pill. Just you got to get the real stuff. And that's why that little pomegranate, they, they, they probably have good, you know, they make a lot of money because it's it's really true that if you drink that stuff, it will get you'll have protection to some degree because the studies show it from flavonoids. It's delicious too. So I, you know, I, I so I just do it a different. I do the wine. I do dark chocolate, and, and these are really there's no there's no there's all data. This is all true. I, these are good questions, Swaminator. Beet, B E E T, the the root vegetable. I, don't, I think so. I don't. I have to pass on. I don't know. I, this is now. I'm lost on that. Fenugreek. Fenugreek. Isn't that that's the testosterone booster? But you know what though? I would just say just go on testosterone if you need it. <laughs> okay. Red yeast rice. Red yeast rice is legitimately a natural statin drug. So game on. But I just I like to live better through real chemistry. It's just too weak. I just want the real stuff. Plus I use other stuff. I use combo. But so. Red yeast rice has been shown to be a great alternative to people that can't take, you know, kind of potent statins, and it does lower the LDL cholesterol. So, but if you if you take it and you're statin induced, and if you're intolerant to statins and you take it, if it's two, it's 1,200 milligrams, 600 milligrams twice a day, once in different doses. You don't if you can't really regulate the quality because it's a supplement, and you might not they, you can't regulate quality so well, depending on what you buy. It, it, you you could get side effects like statins. So it's it's a statin. I think it's I think it's uh, lowest. It's the exact chemical makeup 
of a statin. You know, these chemical companies are not dumb. They, they've looked at organic, real, natural agents like digitalis, statins, this drug, and they just took them back to the lab over decades and they just tweak them to, to make them, you know, they just tailor them to what they want on the molecule. Oh, I, so, didn't, I didn't think those people were dumb by any means. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, they get patents on it. And then uh, welcome to uh, pharmaceutical drug companies. And it's a multiple billion dollar business. Last and least, because I've never heard of it, citrus bergamot. Bergamot? Bergamot? I have to pass on I'm just tired. I, I don't know. I, Ooh, I have to pass well, on that. That was a long list of stuff, so yeah. That was, that was, that was a good list, though. Yeah, I, I think I did okay. I, I didn't launch you off too bad. Swami, you're back. You're back on the scene, Swami. Swaminator. Uh, that will do it for this episode. We're back in the question game if you guys keep your questions coming. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to keep stealing Dr. Tom's videos, which I don't mind doing one bit. They're great videos. And again, I want to encourage everyone, go to Dr. Thomas's YouTube channel, Anabolic Doc. Excellent videos. He puts out one or two great ones every week. They have, you know, little time stamps so you know exactly what he's talking about where. Like a little table of contents. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Very well researched. Uh, you don't have to listen to me blathering on about like my dog when I was 12 years old or something. And uh, that's it. I want you guys to check out the websites, metabolicdoc.com and anabolicdoc.com. You can pick up this book here or there or on Amazon, America on Steroids, A Time to Heal. And Dr. O'Connor, thank you for your time, your expertise, your knowledge. Uh, I know you're a very, very busy guy, so I very much appreciate you taking this time every week to help out all these viewers that need need to have access to this information from an actual medical doctor muscular development i 10 years coming up we got to do so it was 10 years i got to try to find the first of us it was it was in the fall steve called me and it was it was 2009 so i we i i think it was one of the fall i got to look but we should do something for 10 years ron and i went out 10 years i got a mug so you know you might get a mug <laughs> How many guys are still writing in the magazine 10 years later with me? Uh, maybe a couple like uh, Dr. Dan, Dan Guartney, maybe a couple of the, the science people, the doctors. But uh, other than that, no. no. Not many people. Not many people at all. Yeah. The, law, the anabolic lawyer, I think, is still in there, right? Oh, yeah, Rick Collins, has been, Rick Collins Rick, has been there for a long time. Rick, Rick's in there. Is Bill Llewellyn in there still or no? I don't no, think Bill's... No, Bill... Bill... Uh, uh, he was in there up until maybe six or eight months ago, I want to say. Well, I think so. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. You're okay. Last, last of the, we're the last of the Mohicans. <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks for thanks watching for Ask the Anabolic Doc with Dr. Thomas O'Connor. Please check us out next time, and we'll see you then.